computer. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. I am Gabriella Handel, a draftsman and the host of this show, A Conversation About Art, during which I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different art artistic fields. Today, I bring you episode 22, and I will have this conversation with Dory Wynott, a watercolorist. Dory, thank you very much for talking to me today. Please tell our viewers and listeners who you are and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to do this with you. Um, so uh, my name is Dory Wynott. Um, as you said, I'm a watercolorist. Um, I also do uh, pen and ink illustrations. Um, pretty much everything that I do um, kind of focuses on uh, people and portraiture and, you know, humano humanoid figures um, and kind of all the nuances that, um, that kind of come with that. So, um, you know, ranging from physical to, you know, anatomical structure and, and things like that is something I'm really interested in, um, to more abstract things like, you know, emotions and, and memories, um, and just all, all of that just kind of really fascinates me. Um, and through that, I kind of incorporate different themes, um, and explore things like horror, nature elements, um, romance, uh, death, um, just kind of a lot of abstract things uh, kind of contextualized through, um, you know, people and people shaped things. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So this is only tangentially related as a question, but I want to ask anyway, because I'm curious and maybe a little nosy, I guess. I don't know. Sure. But anyway, <laughs> it's just that uh, you've addressed your last name once or twice. Yes. And, and, and you said that it's just, it's just your last name. So it's not like an invented word, but it's an actual surname. It's actually my, my surname. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's of German origin. Um, I believe I'm, I'm not sure what the, um, what the, the actual German root name of it is, but, um, I, I do feel like I got a little bit lucky with my, uh, with my career choice and, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, really. and my last name, but, uh, but yeah, it's, just my name. <laughs> okay. I like it. I mean, cause it has, I don't know. I feel like the, it sounded, it, it's sounding like the question, why not has like a, like a whimsical sort of playful sort of thing to it. I don't know. And, and I don't know. I kind of like relating that to you. Cause <laughs> I think sometimes you also have that about your work in a way. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Yeah. I just, I find that uh, detail um, fun and entertaining. Okay, oh, thank <laughs> so uh, thank you for indulging my of question. Of course, yeah. <laughs> and all right, so I would like it if you went more into the medium that you use, which is watercolor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder how you ended up with watercolor and why do you think that you stuck with it? Um, so I ended up with watercolor initially just out of circumstance. Um, I trained uh, as an oil painter when I was in uh, school uh, doing my BFA and um, just the way things went um, after I graduated, the situation that I was living in, I was working out of my apartment um, and with oil paints comes a lot of, um, you know, fumes and, and cleanup and, and space and things like that. Um, so it wasn't very practical for uh, the time being, which actually turned out to be a lucky thing because when I, um, you know, was kind of searching for an alternative, uh, you know, medium for painting um, to kind of scratch that painting itch. Um, mm. I just decided to try watercolor for the sake of its convenience. Um, mm. You know, it's it's it can be really fast. Um, the cleanups a lot easier than oil paints are. Um, and I just kind of ended up falling in love with it. Um, I really love um, how it builds itself up um, in a very similar way that you can with oil paint, but uh, it it has a it has a quality to it where you can almost see the process um, in the finished product because it's mm. you know transparent, mm. um, and that's something that I I really love seeing in in other works as well as um, things that kind of have like a um, you know, a sketchy quality or kind of like an ethereal, like you can see the build. Um, it just really, something about it really clicked with me and I've been doing it for seven years now, I think. Oh, I, I don't think I'm going to be switching anytime soon. So, yeah, yeah. okay. All right. So you, so you liked it enough that you can see yourself continuing to use it, uh, just Absolutely. into the future. 
Okay. Yeah, I feel like I'm, to be totally honest, I, I still feel like I'm trying to get a grasp on it and I feel like I'm learning about it all the time and I love that about it too. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm at now. <laughs> yeah, the constant problem sol solving is also like a pretty uh, satisfying pursuit in art. Yes. <laughs> really. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, I like what you said about being able to see the process in the, finish, in the finished product. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because I, I, I mean, I, I also enjoy that uh, in being able to kind of see my tracks kind of in, mm -hmm. in work. That's a great uh, phrase for it, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, because like, you know, you can see, or at least, you know, and I'm talking specifically about charcoal because that's where I experienced it the first time. Uh, where I would like make a line and charcoal is kind of like more stainy quote unquote than uh, graphite I guess because it's darker I don't know exact I don't know really the detail of the chemistry in that case but mm -hmm. it's like if you erase it you have like a shadow of it left it's pretty mm -hmm. difficult to completely erase charcoal especially if it's like charcoal pencil you know because uh, it yeah. has more more um, binder so uh, yeah that's that's a really that's a I can definitely appreciate how that would be appealing about watercolor in spite of it being an unruly mistress Yes, yes, and it's very much that too, but <laughs> that's cool. But but then it's like, yeah, I don't know, and, and um I, I wouldn't say that I necessarily feel that way about graphite, for example, because I'm very comf comfortable and kind of confident in a way, not completely, uh, but mm -hmm. somewhat confident in knowing its behavior when I'm gonna go draw. Um Okay. Yeah, because I mean, I'm not sure. I, I mean, uh, I guess I'm calling back kind of to what I was just saying about how uh, being an artist is constant problem solving. And I mean, it, it is even if you're familiar with the medium, but I, I guess I wonder how would I feel. I have played once or twice with watercolor and um, it might be my ignorance and my lack of patience in terms of getting to know the medium more. But mm -hmm. um, I guess I, I wonder in terms of, you know, if what you wanted was to paint, how come you didn't? Or, or why do you think, rather, why why do you think you didn't, uh, I mean, did you try like acrylic, for example? Acrylic paints, um, it's also water-based, you know, no fumes. I've done acrylic in the past um, and I do, um, I, I love acrylics. I'm, I'm not sure why I landed on watercolor exactly. I had actually had kind of a, a conflicting experience with it before when I was in school. I had taken a watercolor class and it just didn't really, I, I don't know, it didn't really sit with me. Um, and it kind of always stuck with me that something about it didn't didn't click when I was in that more academic setting. Um, I think I was kind of just more curious to maybe explore it kind of on my own terms mm -hmm. and just kind of figure it out and see how I like to use it, yeah. um, which, uh, you know, that's not to say anything bad about, you know, like technique or anything like that, because those things are definitely important. But mm. um, I think sometimes, um, I do think sometimes discovering things on your own terms can have a very different effect than when they're presented to you in a specific way. Yeah. Um, so it was just kind of an impulse thing of, you know, hey, you know, I'll, I'll try to revisit it and see if anything different happens. And, um, and interestingly enough, after, you know, kind of playing around with it and just figuring out what it was about it that I liked and what I wanted to do, that's when I felt the more inclination to kind of backtrack and learn some of the more, you know, uh, technical uh, aspects of it, how to use the medium and, you know, uh, what the what the labels on the paints mean in terms of like mm -hmm. what pigments to look for and things like that. Um, so just kind of, a, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I guess um, some learning requires presentation in different contexts for different people. Yeah, 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 for sure. That makes a lot of sense. So then what would you say were the things that you discovered for yourself versus what was taught in the, the more technical class? Um, I found that I really liked having a more, I'm trying to look for the phrase. Um, I liked finding my own approach. Um, the structure that was given to me when it was taught um, was a very traditional one of kind of establishing, you know, your shapes with maybe like pencil or something like that, and then building it up slowly in washes going from more vague to specific. Um, and I do still do that. But one thing that really grabbed me was um, 
actually just working from beginning to end entirely in the paint. Um, I don't usually do any sort of uh, drawing with pencil or anything like that or set any guidelines. I'll do my sketching uh, kind of with a lighter wash and a smaller brush directly on the page. Um, mm. And in doing that, it's not a process that's for everyone. I mean, you know, it's kind of a, a preferential thing. Um, I really like not having a dead set plan on how I want a piece to end up. Um, mm -hmm. I do sometimes, um, certainly, but um, sometimes I'll, I'll set out and just kind of not really know where it's going to, to end up. Um, and I, I like that the thinking process um, and the planning process can be more simultaneous with the actual making sometimes rather than having them be more separated. Okay, so then the more technical or quote unquote traditional method of using a watercolor is is with like you make a sketch with pencil, and I mean is that what they were, is that what they taught you? And then you do your washes, and then very slowly start kind of tightening up. Yeah, my understanding of it. I mean, it wasn't like you know that strict per se, but um, kind of yeah, and and also in terms of like planning colors and and things like that. Just um, you know, I I liked. Um, I liked not thinking about it in such a structured way necessarily mm -hmm. and just kind of being a little bit more intuitive. Um, I think needing that uh, that kind of freedom of working from instinct um, was kind of necessary in, in sparking an interest, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like the way that you described um, how you work really sounds almost like the opposite of the, the, like the traditional one, because it's like, yeah. you know, I'm just going to paint... <laughs> right on the page right away the drawing <laughs> yeah that sounds really cool and badass kind of because it's like fearless in a way in the sense that um i don't know i mean there's no erasing with watercolor even uh, i mean i imagine there's i mean you can't i can't imagine you can erase unless you paint with white yeah it. it's um it's kind of funny you can depending on the nature of the the actual color that you're using um you can do what's called lifting um which is uh sort of where if you take like a clean wet brush um you can kind of like scrub away the paint a little bit and sometimes it will leave a stain on the page but you can kind of it's sort of erasing mm -hmm. um but um but the paint has to be wet for you to be able to do that no uh, not necessarily. Um, sometimes when it's, it, it really depends on the color that you're using. Um, certain pigments have a higher staining power, um, than others, but, uh, but yeah, it, you know, it, you get a feel for it after, after some trial and error. And of course that can, you know, backfire if you like kind of over scrub out an area and that's certainly happened, but you know, it comes with the risk, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so that, that reminds me a little bit of uh, when I make drawings with ballpoint pen, mm -hmm. um, because when I start a, a drawing uh, with ballpoint pen, I generally start with very soft marks. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, it's not that dissimilar in that sense from graphite, because one kind of also starts with very soft marks. And then as you become more confident in the shape that you made, you make darker marks and then you make your tones and all that stuff. But then it's mm -hmm. like those darker marks in the upper layers, I guess, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of, uh, what allows one to get away with the lighter marks that might not have been correct at the beginning because they're not as visible because of the darker contrast of the heavier marks. Exactly, um, yeah. And sometimes, yeah, as the process goes on, just like with graphite, um, you know, even if you make mistakes earlier on that are lighter, um, they'll seem really obvious at the time. But as you your work progresses, um, you know, relative to your, the other values that you're building on top, that, you know, that thing that you could like blaringly see, you know, at the beginning of the process, you might not even be able to see it all. Towards might as well not end, be there, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, trust okay. the process. Uh, <laughs> So when you use ink, what do you, what tools do you use? Is it a, I do not, what is it a fountain pen or is it just a ballpoint pen or what kind of tools? Yeah, do you use I, I have a bunch of different pens um, that I really like to use. Uh, my favorite uh, one, I think qualifies as what's called a technical pen, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's essentially the same as a fountain pen where there's an ink reservoir um, that you fill up. And I use fountain pen ink with it um, rather than something permanent or waterproof like India ink. Um, I use uh, a, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the brand name. I think it's 
Koinor uh, uh, Rapido mm -hmm. sketch. Um, and uh, it has a really nice flow and a super, super fine uh, nib. So similar to um, similar to kind of what you do with ballpoint pen, actually. Um, it's really easy to kind of uh, lay out very light marks to start. Um, and it really responds well to um, the type of strokes that you lay down and the pressure. Um, and you can really control like how much of a mark you actually make on the page. Oh, um, and I find that permanency like really satisfying in terms of like having to really think about, you know, the control that you need in terms of where you're at in the actual drawing process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so this pen that you're talking about, um, so it, it's responsive to pressure in terms that you can make light marks uh, by make by doing it lightly versus making a darker mark by doing it a, a little bit. Lighter. Yeah, you can kind of um, you can have a lighter touch on the page definitely, and then also the speed at which uh, you do it will kind of control the ink flow a little bit. Ah, so. Interesting. If you make a slower uh, drag, it's going to, you know, make a darker mark. Um, whereas if you're a little bit more quick, it's going to be kind of, uh, you know, a little bit more lighter and mm -hmm. fleeting. That sounds really interesting because I kind of thought it was like um, this one pen that I discovered recent, uh, somewhat recently. It has like a really, really tiny ballpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, it's a Pentel sli Slitchy. I don't know how you spell it, but it's a very Ooh. small ballpoint. Yeah, and but but yeah. the the ink is water based instead of oil based like the Bic. So oh, then, interesting. Yeah, so like the it's kind of it's so like the water based ink is kind of more like a marker in the sense that it doesn't respond to pressure like I was saying just now. You I wouldn't say that you can necessarily make lighter marks. And it's mm -hmm. really more like when you go to do like your volume type stuff, you kinda of do it you kinda of have to do it with cross hatching instead of like pressure like fading out type stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you can do with the, the or um, that you can do with the ballpoint pen similarly to graphite as well. So so it sounds like the the technical pen that you're talking about is not like the water based ink. It's it's kind of so in, like between, in between, I would say. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a, a halfway medium um, between those. Where, you know, if you were to do some like really heavy duty shading, um, then yeah, you're probably going to want to go with you know more of a hatching technique than um, than kind of like a, a shading um, like you would do with ballpoint pen or graphite. Um, but in terms of like your line quality, um, it definitely responds to you know. Um, you can get a little bit of variance um, in terms of like how you're actually laying your mark down. Mm. Um, and I, I kind of like that it has that duality of, yeah. uh, you know. You can... Yeah, yeah, I definitely, I really, be, I mean, because when you put up drawings made with this, with this pen, mm -hmm. uh, the marks are really, I mean, it's obviously your hand is there, so it's like your mark, but like the line that the, that the pen makes mm -hmm. are, they're just beautiful lines. So that's, that's really nice. And it makes me curious. I mean, and uh, uh, thank you also again for, for elaborating on that. Okay. So um, when, when do you turn to watercolor to make something versus when you turn to the technical pen to make something like, what do you feel that you can say with watercolor that you can't say with the pen and, you know, vice versa? Um, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, definitely, uh, one of them is, is color. Um, you know, if I feel more inclined for a piece to have, you know, full color, or even if it's like a monochromatic, um, that's definitely part of the process. Um, you know, in terms of if color is important for, you know, setting some sort of mood, or if there's something that I want to say, um, through that. Um, also with watercolor being my primary medium, it's, you know, the thing that I'll, I'll usually go to the most, um, the nature of watercolor is almost on the opposite end of the spectrum as, you know, doing drawings with a pen mm -hmm. in that, you know, watercolor kind of has a mind of its own and you can make very, you know, bold and kind of big squishy paint marks and, and, you know, lay things down very quickly. Um, and you have a lot of you know, options in terms of you can make things very vague or very detailed, kind of all, you know, within one medium. Um, whereas pen drawings um, is all, it's much tighter. Um, and uh, it's, I really love working with uh, pen drawings when I want to when I want to get a lot of detail on something, um, not necessarily detail as in like detail of the image, but like um, 
you know, components of the drawing that I, that have very little like details in them, kind of more like illustrative qualities. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, at the same time, it's also more minimal because you're not dealing with so much in terms of, you know, color and uh, the type of marks that you can get. Um, and I like having that challenge. Um, I, I kind of feel like uh, doing doing drawings with a pen um, is I, I call it my my creative outlet away from my creative outlet mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. because uh, when you know when when art is your job um, you know in any capacity um, of course it's you know something we're artists it's it's what we love it's what we do um, but something being your main focus is of course going to change it um, you know in whatever capacity so I think it's really important to have uh, things that you can fall back on that you can still be creative, but um, you're doing something kind of different and you can kind of let your brain refresh and your eyes refresh and uh, it, it can feel really good sometimes, you know, if I'm feeling stuck uh, with one medium to kind of switch to the other and then have to kind of reset my thinking. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's good for that, I think. <laughs> yeah, I really like what you, the... What did you say? Oh, creative outlet. Away from a oh, creative outlet. <laughs> away from the creative outlet. Yeah, that's really yeah. good because because you know if you if you like stick to one one super specific thing like that becomes in itself uh, a little cage in a way where you have limitations because mm -hmm. obviously like the mediums are different and the uh, one does things that the other one cannot do so like sometimes you want to try another thing or you want to just just for kicks just for the creativity or for like the freedom or whatever it is so like that. That's, a, that's such a good way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna, okay. The, um, I'd like it if you went a little bit more into the subject matter um, of the stuff that you, uh, you refer to watercolors as paintings, right? Yes, yeah. Okay. I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's just that like, I, I often, um, I often get a kick out of being like, wait, is it a drawing? Is it a painting? It has color, <laughs> it has like paste, you know, anyway, whatever. <laughs> uh, it's like, it's like a fun little, like a tongue twister in a way. A little puzzle, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little puzzle, yeah, exactly. So yeah, I'd like it if you want a little bit more into, into the subject matter of uh, the images that you make. Um, why do you think you tend to make the figure so often? I not just, every, almost every time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think that. I mean, I guess is it valid to say? I just think like the people shapes are just like really beautiful and mm -hmm. like kind of mind blowing. Um, and I think you can you know relate to that too because yes. you do you know absolutely gorgeous and like so detailed and studied you know anatomical uh drawings um it's just there's something about it that i love i love that it has um so many contrasts in you know the shapes that are you know very hard and you know these systems like you know skeletons and and whatnot that are just you know, it's like a puzzle um, where, you know, if you take an isolated, you know, bone or something like that, it, it doesn't really look like it makes any sense. But then you put it next to, you know, it's two adjacent pieces in the system and it fits together like so perfectly. Mm -hmm. And even in a way that like moves around, I just think that's like utterly fascinating. Yes. Um, and, you know, same thing with other, you know, anatomical systems. Um, I also love um, exploring, you uh, what the implications are, you know, when you pose a figure in different ways and how um, things like emotion and expression come through, um, not just in the face, which, you know, is going to be, you know, kind of a primary cue, but how those things are subtly expressed through kind of the entire body mm -hmm. um, and, you know, finding that that flow of like, you know, whatever's going on in the head, um, you know, in the actual like the person in there and how that is coming out through their um, through their physicality. It's like I just, act it out. Yes. Yeah. I, I never get tired of that. I think it's just like the coolest thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah, that's that's quite that's uh, that's quite lovely. And it really is very interesting. Uh, how, I don't know, just even if you're just drawing a model from life who is argu ar arguably just standing there, it's like one can still divine like a constellation of feelings 
that Absolutely, might be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that might be whatever the person might be thinking, if they're having, you know, or maybe not even necessarily related to the person, like personally in their life, but like, what are they conveying via the mm -hmm. pose? Or and, like, are they like cold or like, you know, yeah. and, like literally anything. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. It's like, uh, I find, um, I find very moving when, when I have had the opportunity of drawing from a model, like even just uh, when they breathe or, or if they take a particularly deep breath and like their the ribs like kind of you know they do that unbelievable movement of theirs because it's not yep. you know it's not yep. fanning exactly <laughs> because they're like on an angle like in a slanted angle so they kind of do fan but they kind of do a th just like an expansion that happens and yeah then yeah settling. And, yeah <laughs> yeah and, and I, I I find I mean that's just like one example obviously because I mean uh, once or um occasionally when I have drawn from a model they'll do like a you know he because I mean I've, I've also I've also posed for art classes and it's like you know it's not comfortable or anything so it's like you it's like you you have like fidgety things and it's like when I see them doing that it's like oh you know they're uncomfortable and that sucks but that looks really cool you know yeah. <laughs> so it's like this whole yeah, there's like this whole thing, because like uh, as a viewer, then a person looking at your work and the body of the character that you drew expressing that information kind of has like that same dialogue between the viewer and the body of your, I get, I mean, I'm just making, I'm trying to make like a relationship between me looking at a model while I'm trying mm -hmm. to draw the model and like a person looking at your work, because it's like, like you're saying, you know, the body uh, talks, it says something in a way to mm -hmm. the viewer and that's, that's pretty cool communication. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. stuff there that um, we might not be necessarily aware of. Okay. Um, okay, Miss Why Not. Um, what is art in your opinion? Ooh, big questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, obviously a very difficult thing to define. Um, I think that, I think that the only really like solid and necessary component into um, defining something as art or not art is I think that somebody needs to come along and declare it as such. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that art is something that happens just inherently by itself. Um, it's there has to be some sort of decision involved, um, you know, because when you if somebody says this is art, they are framing it in such a way mm -hmm. um, they're putting it in that context um, and, you know, they're presumably doing that for a reason. Um, and so personally, I mean, I, I think that's enough. I think if you can, you know, if you have a compulsion and a, uh, and a drive and a reason to, you know, when I say framing, I don't mean like literally framing, but I, yeah, yeah. you know, like putting it, you know, framing it in a view of, you know, being, being art, um, then, you know, I think it's within your right to argue that it is. Um, I think that uh, beyond that, you know, that kind of leads to the idea that art is a form of communication, um, which, uh, you know, I, I think is pretty consistent um, in terms of, you know, what it's been used for, you know, throughout the centuries and like through different mediums and, and things like that. Um, I you know, communication can be something as uh, as stark as, you know, a form of journalism. You know, if you look at, you know, art history, um, people recording, you know, the different, like, you know, historical events and like, you know, lifestyles of different, you know, classes landscapes. and things like that going on. Yeah, yes. exactly. Landscapes, um, you know, and you can use that in a historical context. Um, or, you know, it can be a lot more complex and abstract than that. Um, you know, you can be recording uh, <clears throat> something as like hard to grasp as, you know, some sort of emotion or something like that. Um, and when you're framing something as art, you're, you're making a point to make that apparent to someone else. And I think that's where the, the communication part comes in. Um, or, you know, if you're making something that, you know, never sees the light of day to anyone except yourself, you know, I, I think that like journaling is a form of communication. You know, you're externalizing something that is going on in your head, uh, you know, you're kind of separating that from yourself so you can look at it um, and kind of process it through, you know, like on a page or, you know, outside of yourself. So it's still, you know, a form of communication in, in that sense. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I mean, I think I think that that's that's kind of how I would. The only kind of thing that I would say is like necessary when it comes to like defining uh, art. Anything beyond that, I think, is like can be totally open to interpretation, and mm. and you know, I'm sure we'll be debating and arguing it until the end of time. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, that's one of the cool things, really, that it's kind of a never ending can be a never-ending answer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. whomever tries to answer the question. Okay, um, okay, so like the aspect of communication, um, or, you know, the subject of communication, I guess, has come up again in the converse, in the, in, in our, when, in our conversation, which I, I think is really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was thinking about what you just said of the journaling part because, uh, you know, one doesn't necessarily um, show journals as you would a drawing, you know, mm -hmm. like in a, an exhibition or something. But at the same time, uh, I've actually been learning to communicate to, to polish my communication skills thanks to my husband, who is really good at it in the sense, you know, like more but more in like the the relationship romantic type stuff or just mm -hmm. just in general, like talking and like that kind of stuff. And um Um, I was just, it's just that, you know, one, I, I guess, or at least I think of the, when I think of the term communication, I feel, or like my gut reaction is that gut thought or whatever it is, is that there has to be two people. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you do journaling, um, there, there's all obviously just you, just mm -hmm. the individual writing down whatever it is, but at the same time. And I've ex that's what I've experienced via learning to communicate with my husband is that sometimes while you're saying something or mm -hmm. writing something, sometimes stuff will happen right as you're saying something like in your head. Like if you're trying to, if you're trying to figure out an idea, if you're trying to figure out how you feel, why you feel something or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and you start saying why you think you feel the way you feel, or you're trying to talk it out, you know, like sometimes it happens that or it, it's happened to me for sure. And I mean, I expect that to happen to other people as well, mm -hmm. because we're not that different. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so like, um, it definitely happens to me that I realize something while I'm saying the thing that I'm trying to understand. And it's like, oh, okay, so it might be that. And then I'll say that. And then it's like this whole, e even, even, and, and that has also happened to me while I'm writing something out. Mm -hmm. uh, that I have this re little realization, like it's very fast and it's kind of amazing that the brain can do that, that we can do that in our brains, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so like that, even if, you know, even if there isn't another person talking with you, like mm -hmm. that communication is like still happening. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making a loop and you can only see like part of it up here and like in the, in the camera, but I'm making a, a loop <laughs> with like the notebook that I have here uh, to take notes. And it's like this, that is the, like it's a communication with, with you like with what you wrote and i don't know i just like that aspect um yeah yeah and i mean saying. i think that you know like communication obviously doesn't have to be words and you know um it, it's not like i mean a lot of artists keep sketchbooks and i i don't mm. see how that's like totally that different from a journal where it's like right. okay well it's probably not something that i'm going to show but i'm going to try to you know work through some things um and you know just allow myself to kind of make mistakes and maybe figure things out. And that might be an idea that might be, um, you know, something that you're trying to practice that you want to do for a bigger piece that might be even, even it might literally be journaling and that you're just trying to like work some things out just through images rather than words. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah, I, I think that, um, I think it's totally possible to, you know, have that communication with even just yourself. Um, and um, sometimes there's a duality there where, you know, it might start as a communication, you know, with just yourself and, you know, then it uh, ends up being something that you show, you know, publicly and, and then you're having that communication with them. It involves um, other people. Yeah. Exactly. It starts, it starts bringing other people in. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. So, all right. So the other thing that I liked about what you were saying about, uh, your thoughts about what art is, is also the part about, uh, something being declared art. Um, and what I like about, or, or at least it makes me think that, you know, something being declared art or, you know, when you, when a person makes something mm -hmm. and the, the, and how art is a form of communication. Um, I enjoy what I, 
um, I enjoy that both those things require participation, mm -hmm. deliberate mm -hmm. participation, yes. willing participation uh, on the part of, um, I guess, I, I guess in this case, mainly the person making it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, wa I, I want to ask you about the declaring the art, de declaring something to be art part. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, what is your opinion in that case of, uh, you know, like, you know, when you're making something, you're painting a watercolor or whatever it is, it takes you an undetermined amount of time and you put this effort and thought and uh, physical work into it, you know, like what, what, um, how do you compare or what are your feelings of that versus the other type of stuff that get, that gets declared art effectively that is kind of the opposite of that in the sense that it didn't take any making on the part of the self-declared artist in another case other than just being like this is art and it's mm -hmm. gonna get into MoMA <laughs> you know like yeah, that kind yeah. of whatever <laughs> like you know like because um, it's very it's uh it of course I immediately thought of Duchamp it's like a Duchamp thing yes. if anything he like yeah. invented it or something he's like the father of that in a way mm -hmm. uh, not ne not necessarily because everything has precedent has like uh, something you know it was coming from before mm -hmm. but um um, yes. Yeah, so what, what do you think of those things? I think that in, in that type of case, I think that there's still, there's still a declaration that's being made, um, that has less to do with the object and more to do with the, the attention being drawn to the statement of, you know, like t taking an everyday object and just declaring it art. Um, in that case, I, I would argue that the actual art part of it isn't really the object so much as like the statement and the act um, of, you know, taking something that like, arguably is not art and calling it art. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that um, I think that it gets really complicated when you get into that area, um, and it can be really intimidating, actually, um, especially to, uh, you know, newer artists or younger artists, where when you study things uh, like this, um, you know, that kind of come up in art history a lot and things like that, um, I think that it can lead to feeling like they're supposed to be, there's a lot of pressure that, um, you know, the thing that you're trying to say by feeling like the need to make art, um, like the message should be something really profound and like earth shattering and like entirely new. Um, and I think it can certainly, and, you know, amazing things have been said through like the, you know, the statement of like calling something art. Um, but I don't think that it necessarily has to be. Um, I think that like, I don't really believe in, you know, the, the phrase like art for art's sake. Um, and I don't mean that in an exclusionary way and that, you know, if some, if there is like art for art's sake, I don't like believe in the thing. I mean, that I don't think that art for art's sake is something that, um, I don't think it's something that exists necessarily. I think that even if your if your message that you're trying to say by making something is very simple or very literal, um, it's still something that you're trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, if you're not saying something that's like, you know, making some like profound, you know, philosophical or like political statement or something like that. Um, you know, if you are sitting down and like, you want to draw a picture of, you know, a flower in a vase by a window, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that a lot of people would argue that it's, you know, I think that when you're doing that, you know, the, the thing that you're trying to say can be as simple as like, hey, like, did you notice this? You know, mm -hmm. like, like, look at that color. Like, isn't that neat? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you're feeling a compulsion to, to capture something. Um, and I think that that's totally legitimate. So I would say that, you know, the complexity isn't really what defines it necessarily. It's just the fact that you are trying to say something or, you know, make someone notice something that they might mm -hmm. not have otherwise. Okay. Um, so what do you understand about the, because I mean, uh, about, I mean, I want to ask you about the art for art, art, um, art for art's sake, mm -hmm. uh, bit that you were saying. And, um, I've been reading about the pre-Raphaelites and mm -hmm. I, ha I think I've said that for like the past five episodes or something, cause I've been reading about him for a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, 
And so it, it seems like the art for art's sake movement came out of not the pre-Raphaelites exactly, but uh, just from the that era, like Victorian something around the time. And so that's kind of one of the things that happened. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what I'm trying to say is that I haven't exactly, I haven't gotten to reading what they mean or what they were trying to talk about with the, with the movement. So um, what, what, what do you understand from this art for art, art's sake, the phrase at least, what do you, what do you think it means? Um, I, I don't, admittedly, I don't under, I don't know a whole lot about the actual, like, it, like historical era, um, you know, that, that particular movement. My understanding is that it focused a lot on, um, you know, a lot more on the aesthetics of a piece rather than, you know, um, whatever the alternative of that might be. Um, but I, I think that what I was trying to say is like that, that attitude, like you can absolutely, you know, concern yourself with the aesthetic of a piece. But I think that, that, uh, if, if that's your focus by, by making the piece is just, you know, because it's, it's beautiful or, you know, something like that. I, I think that that's enough. Um, because, uh, you know, you're still, you're still feeling compelled to, draw someone's attention to that mm -hmm. um you know to to the beauty of something okay all right yeah i think i think the um, and and again i want to reiterate that i'm i'm like i'm not really that well versed in art history or any of that stuff um, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no just just because i'm not trying to like necessarily assert anything um mm -hmm. but uh, i get the impression that the the thing about art for art's sake Art for art for art's sake is almost like a spin-off of something that started around the Renaissance, mm -hmm. um, because um, it it seems like around that time, like with Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, like they wanted to elevate art mm -hmm. to fine art, and so like at that around the times, because like before that, art and craft was basic was the same basically, mm -hmm. or that's mm -hmm. what I understand so far. Yeah. Um, and they wanted to make it into a more cerebral, intellectual, thoughtful sort of thing. And so like they wanted to elevate art to a more stu more studied, studious type thing to mm -hmm. try to say something important and elevating and uh, edifying with the work they were making. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the art for art's sake thing is kind of a spinoff of further from that still where they, like art can exist just like kind of, I mean, kind of, I don't know. It kind of makes me think of now that I'm again, like I'm talking it out. Uh, makes me think of what you were saying earlier about you know you just want to talk about something that you that just caught your attention, mm -hmm. and it doesn't mm -hmm. have to have some super high-minded thing behind it, you know? Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> and that's that's also yeah that's also pretty. I mean, of course, it has a right to exist if mm -hmm. if an individual thinks was like drawn or compelled by that image or like, you know, by like the vase by the window, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, there's beautiful sunlight coming in or something of the sort. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, all right. What is then Miss Why Not? What is beauty in your opinion? Beauty is obviously super subjective. So it's therefore going to be like super difficult to define. Mm -hmm. Um, I can only, uh, talk about beauty in terms of like, you know, what I think is beautiful, um, sure, yeah. because, you know, as with everyone, um, that's just, that's just going to be the case. Um, I think that, I think that beauty really boils down to, uh, where, where something becomes to a point where you can't explain it necessarily mm -hmm. or reason it um and yet you know it it just is um you know i i don't know why you know like if i'm going for a walk and i see you know like a weird like shape that the spine on a leaf is making i couldn't tell you why that like makes me happy to look at but it does mm -hmm. i just i think it's gorgeous mm -hmm. um and uh i just think it's really like wild that you know things things exist and like we're just here to like witness it all and it's like mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. no one can explain why um and that's i i think that that in itself is kind of beautiful that that mystery that you know 
and and I also find a lot of beauty in um, kind of finding parallels in those things happening too. So like things like um, analogous structures showing up in in nature and things like that, um, where you know you can find these repeating patterns in between things that are you know entirely seemingly have nothing to do with each other, um, mm -hmm. and you know it all just kind of exists in the same universe um, and. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's weird to think about, and it and it gets more difficult to kind of keep a grasp on the more that I think about it. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's I think it's really when it's when you can't explain something, um, you know, why you love it or why it makes you happy, um, but it just does. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, well, in previous conversations that I've had the nature aspect mm -hmm. in relationship to beauty has come up. I, uh, I think it's, I mean, I'm not keeping tally or anything, but I, I have the impression that it's like the, the, the one that has been related to the most mm -hmm. to beauty, which, uh, nature. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really cool. Um, because, um, I have the feeling that humans, you know, I have the feeling that we, have a tendency to try to pretend that we're not mind blown by nature. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and I think, I just think it's cool that, um, you know, you and other people have said that effectively there's like this connection, even, even if we can't explain or name or, you know, really go into like concrete detail about why mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. so, you know, it's like, why, why can't I stop staring mm -hmm. at a little leaf in the autumn? Or like, why does that, like, the swoop of that shape just, like, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, make my stomach swoop the same way, you know what I mean? But... Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, the, um, I mean, it, um, I don't know, it almost makes me think that, uh, and it, it has, I have heard uh, one or two people mention it, that, um, not in the conversation, but in other podcasts that I've listened to regarding beauty and art and just like the divine and, you know, uh, touching almost with religion and like that divinity and stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah, um, of course. Yeah. That, um, n naming something almost kind of takes away from its wonder in mm -hmm. uh, sort of. And I mean, I remember using that very thing as an excuse when I was younger and they were, and somebody asked me to explain my work. I was like, oh, it's the mystery that makes it blah, blah, whatever. And it's like, I mean, sure, yeah. <laughs> in, in that case, I was using it as a shield for something. But um, I was trying to get away with like not trying, not writing an art, artist statement or something. Right, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's really something about the mystery of why it is that nature's shapes are so, so, it's like, the, you know, why do they stop one in one's tracks? Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, like, it, uh, you know, even if you've seen a sunset or a sun up a million times, it's like, you still, it's like still, cause you know, like you're thinking it's like, oh, I'm on an earth and it's spinning mm -hmm. around this other star, a whole ass star. It's like, we have our <laughs> own star, you know, kind of in a way. And mm -hmm. it's like, anyway, you know, like the light of that star is touching this earth and it's touching me. And it's like, that stuff is kind of crazy to think about. And it's like, you're just existing in all of it. And it's like, how, how, why? <laughs> it's like, yeah. And it's like, it's a privilege in a way. It's like, a, a, not, not even, it's like a miracle that we get to experience it every day that we wake up. I absolutely That's agree. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, <laughs> um, well, I think this is, um, uh, I don't know. I, I liked, I liked how, um, livening or kind of positive this last bit was yeah so, yeah <laughs> yeah so that that was very nice and i think it's a that's a good place to end the episode so dory i would like it if you told our viewers and listeners what are you up to lately where your work can be found what are you working on any project um just anything and everything you want to talk about that you're currently working on 
Yeah, yeah. I kind of, um, I kind of just bookend, bookended a whole bunch of um, things actually. So I'm kind of in an in an in between right now, and um, just kind of planning the next thing. Um, I have, um, I have a piece currently that's on view um, with the Wow by Wow Galleries, uh, Fiends of the Dark Three. Um, so that'll be up through the 22nd, um, and it'll still be on view on their website. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just kind of. Uh, planning for the next thing um, and I have a few kind of bigger pieces in the works um, that I'm excited to kind of start get the ball rolling on soon so <laughs> okay and when you say a big piece what 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 dimensions are those um, I'm thinking probably, um, I have to see what, you know, what size paper I have actually, but I've been really itching to kind of work, um, you know, bigger, which in terms of watercolor, you know, is, it could go bigger, but, um, yeah. probably like 16 by 20 or, or higher. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to do something like really giant someday. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm sure you can, you know, there's a, there's a technique that, um, I, I'm not that familiar with, but I've done it once or twice for drawings where you mount paper to canvas mm -hmm. and um, I don't know I think you could probably really expand the size of the work that you make via that because like now the paper has not only mm -hmm. because I mean I um, did I ever use wet media on that uh, I think I did and it's like because the paper is like stretched on the canvas as you if you stretch then the canvas on stretchers mm -hmm. it's like the paper is never gonna buckle because it just can't so it's like that's yeah. Um, yeah. So like that might interest you. There's a, there's a, a teacher at the Academy that teaches. I mean, I don't know if he ever teaches it. I'll send you, I'll send you the, to his name and maybe you can uh, email him or something. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So he can explain it. Cause, cause I feel like that would be very interesting. Anyway, I'm totally digressing. No. Um, <laughs> okay. And well, and thank you, uh, Dory very much for joining me. Thank you for your time. Thank you for, for your words and your thoughts. Thank you everyone for joining us. Feel free to let Dory and I know, what you think of this conversation in the comments section. Also, I invite you to subscribe to my audiovisual channel because more of these conversations are coming. I also invite you to like this video and share it with any and all pertinent individuals. If you want to support Dory, myself, this podcast, or all three, the links will be in the video description. And so thank you everyone for your time and attention, and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye.